Do you really need to know statistics when you want to work with Six Sigma quality improvement? Well, up to a point, I think you do. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel, where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And this video, it's inspired, and maybe even a little bit of a reaction to Paul Allen's video that he recently released about not using stupid statistics. So uh, his basic message is, don't learn all the statistics. What you really need are control charts, statistic process control, uh, histogram, so basic descriptive statistics and a little bit of prediction, the, the basic statistics. But then he says that we do not really need things like skewedness or stratification. Uh, and I'll add a, a test of normality to that. It's also a bit of the sort of advanced level on top of Six Sigma. Now, in the basis, I actually agree with what he said, but there are a couple of nuances. And that is, um, to start off, uh, he said, this was in an internet poll. So the, there was one of these so many LinkedIn, Facebook posts that, uh, that ask, this graph that you see here, similar to that, is it skewed or a histogram or normal or stratification? And then the correct answer in that one probably was skewedness. But his comment on that was, you do not need that. Now, on an internet poll on Facebook or LinkedIn, I actually fully agree. He then also said this question was posed by a master black belt and especially master black belts don't need to know. And that is where I do not agree. If you want to make your company a lot of money using Six Sigma, do the basic tools, do them correct, get indeed the proper uh, control chart with sample size and make sure the procedures are working. That will fetch you a lot more money than diving deep into the statistical background. So for white belts, yellow belts, green belts, I would say you do not indeed need that level of statistics. For the black belts and especially the master black belts, so the people coaching the green belts, the people picking projects, checking a bit the fine stuff in the procedures and in the projects your company runs, well, I think you should know, I would say very well at least, quite a bit more than the basic tools, what you are doing. And at such a point, these slightly more advanced statistics, they really do come into play. Now, just a couple of examples that you uh, see quite uh, often, uh, and there's some discussions, do you need it, don't you need it? And I think that this discussion is exactly what gave such a direct reaction for me when I uh, saw Paul's video on, I know, I know, you don't, you don't need to really worry about it too much. But on the other hand, if you never check it, you can really go wrong with it. And, and that's why no, I just wanna go over two examples and sort of set the picture and my idea afterwards of when do you need these what, more involved, and these are not advanced statistics, but these more involved statistical tools and the understanding that they bring. And they are usually about testing the data testing for normality. And that is the, the central tension of what is around Six Sigma and uh, these type of tests. So what we see, if you just look at the, the black lines, see our bell curve. Um, but what we see here actually, and that's what I drew in with, with the red, is the actual bell curve, it, it should be the same on either side. So if it goes up here, it should also come down with the same speed. And actually what the black line is doing, if you put it through a test, is it is showing a lag and a longer tail. Now this is a skewed data set. That purely formally, while well, you cannot really use to, to base all your normality statistics on, um, if you take a bigger sample size or subgroup your samples, you can fix this. But before you do that, well, you sort of need to know that it's needed. So. Uh, purely formally, you're not allowed to, to use this, although I will say that if you uh, use something like this for most of our basic statistical tools, you are going to do the correct things in your process anyway. But there is a, two main things, and the second one will come to this because this has it more clearly. Uh, but uh, the, the other thing, the first thing here is perhaps your process isn't linear to start with. So. Um, you can draw conclusions from this type of data that, that might not 
be accurate, especially if you see the skewedness even stronger, what might be happening is that your process is actually exponential or logarithmic. So when you have, uh, let's say, a bacterial growth type of uh, process going on, uh, where when it starts it goes very fast, or um, sometimes you have a bit the same in uh, flow of oily and non-Newtonian liquids where um, when they start flowing, the flow increases and increases because they get uh, faster, less, uh, well not less dense, but uh, their pulling force is lesser and they, they just flow, they become very smooth. And so a little bit too much, a little bit too much flow means you get a lot more flow, stuff like that, but mainly microbial uh, results. You can see that it really skews to one side. What you can also have is that you have a machine that cuts off, for instance, with a, a check weigher that removes all the light parts. So that in reality, if you go to the underlying data under uh, just drawing out a nice standard deviation, you see that your machine throws away everything to the left of a certain limit. Or uh, when it knows that it cannot make an extra cut into two nice pieces out of the last piece in whatever bar you were cutting, it makes a longer one. So this non-natural, non-normal distribution may actually hide underlying processes. So either that, more microbial uh, or sometimes shear related exponential difference or cutoff points that are in your, uh, in your process so that you don't get your full data or a part of the data isn't completely logical, isn't really representative of what your main process is doing. Now, are these sampling errors? Well, probably this is, this is a sampling error that is uh, more of a how your system behaves error. And I am quite sure uh, that, that Paul would say, well, you have to correct that before you actually start statistics, and that would be correct. You have to know your physical processes before you do statistics on them. So if you don't understand your processes, also don't start with this. But it happens quite a bit anyway. So someone uh, at the black belt, master black belt level, should be able to get these type of clues out of the data. The other one that you uh, see quite often is this uh, QQ graph testing for normality. There's a couple of tests for normality and one of the more popular ones is that you have a QQ chart where uh, you basically plot the, the bell curve in such a way that um, if it would be normally distributed, all the dots that you have should be on a straight diagonal line. Now, what do we see in this graph? Actually, we see that if it was completely normal, you would have expected a straight line. And what we get in our data points is too many of the low and high values, uh, which means that it's basically too wide at the ends. And that means that if we do normality stuff, uh, we're going to underestimate the high ends. So the, the low and very high parts of our distribution will be underrepresented. Now, here, what you usually need to do is increase the number of data points, or at least take it very well into account. Um, if you dive into normal, normality statistics, standard deviation, uh, the, the t-distribution, student t-distribution, what you will see is that when you do such things with a low uh, sample size, you get corrections to correct specifically this. Uh, so quite often, if you go to larger sample sizes, you get rid of this. But what it can also, again, mean is that you will need to take uh, subgroups in your sampling. Those are things to fix it, but what happens if you do not take this into account? Now, for, let's say, the basic types of statistics like um, do these two groups significantly differ, it won't do that much, but when we get into a control chart, a statistical process control chart, this is going to do something, um, well, not so nice to your uh, statistical control process. Now, what we have in our statistical control chart, the expected mean, one, two, three sigmas above, one, two, three sigmas below. 
and what we expect to get is that we should have a normal distribution here. And the normal distribution basically says, well, the chance to hit below or beneath three sigmas is pretty small. The problem, however, is that if your data has these high ends, so a high um, occurrence of very low values and a high occurrence of very high values, what it means is that your actual distribution that you're plotting here is going to give you a lot of hits in these extreme areas. So if you take your normal rules for making an SPC on this, you are going to get a lot of alarms. Now, a lot of alarms still means that you're going to check your machine a bit more often, so it won't immediately cost you your process. You, you won't start steering it off course, hopefully, uh, because you will still be checking before making adjustments. But it does mean that you will be alerting your operators way too often, eroding the trust in SPC, and you get a, a bit of a problem with these SPC rules. Now, if you get too many alarms, at some point people are not going to react to things that are happening and you are going to go out of control. Again, is this going to cost you a lot of money? Not for your first projects. But if you cannot get a good SPC in your organization, then it is going to be harder to get those bucket loads of money from getting a lot of processes under control. And this is why I say the at the green belt level, don't, please don't put too much time and effort into these forms of checking. It would be good to know that it exists, but just do your project, make sure that you stabilize processes, that you get nice standard operating procedures, and that you are checking. And you know, it, it's okay when you check a bit too often, or that you are maybe not 100% reacting to the correct stuff because these things will, and I guarantee you that, still improve your processes. And when you get better at it, then you can go to the minute stuff. But when you have a structure in your organization where you do many of such green belt projects, where you do a lot of Six Sigma projects, then you also have a black belt, a master black belt. Now they should be able to spot these type of things and make the, the corrections there when needed. So check it. Um, don't explain it too much unless you see problems happening, then use it as a nice learning case. So for those people, and that's why for the master black belt, I would say you need to know what you're doing. It is so easy to lie with statistics that if you want to coach people on how to use statistical tools, you should know how the statistics works. Putting it as a multiple choice question on LinkedIn or Facebook, well, I agree, it's not really helping anyone. It's good for such a discussion like we're having right now, uh, but um, that is not what you should be focusing your energy on. This is a niche thing that needs to be known either in your organization or with a consultant that you use from time to time who checks your systems. But indeed, the big majority of continuous improvement specialists and everyone involved in continuous improvement in your organization at your factory they, they don't need to get into this level. Go for the control charts, make sure you have histograms that you visualize your data. That is definitely enough for 80, 90% of people using Six Sigma. Just make sure that a couple of people in your organization or fixed consultants know how to check the validity. And you know, just from time to time, make sure that everything is checked and corrected where needed. And this is how I think this let's call it the statistics behind the tools that we use should be known within your organization. Now, I hope that this video you know, triggered something, uh, maybe got a bit more clarity in the discussion and uh, let me know what you think. How many people, um, maybe all Six Sigma users, should know this type of stuff, should know how to check for stratification, uh, how to assess normality, have a nice discussion in the comments. Also, any questions in those comments are very welcome. For now, I wish you the best of luck in your Six Sigma journey. And also, don't forget to enjoy that journey.